Um, what a beautiful day it is. It's so nice to be with you all. Um, I will take this. February, this is awesome. Nice and warm. Um, so we have this tradition now. It's kind of a new routine in the Formenti household. Um, it's sort of become an unspoken ritual every day. Um, every morning, our kids greet us, and they give us a very quick hug. And then the first thing they ask, all like one at a time, is, can I check the weather, Mom? And so they get my permission, and then they get my, my phone, and they open my Weather Channel app. Um, I have quite a few weather apps, so they get, you know, this, this comes honestly to them. Um, they open the, my Weather Channel app, and they check the high for the day, the low for the day, and then they check the hourly forecast. Um, and then sometimes they will report on the humidity or the chance for rain. But here's the funny thing about my sweet children. It actually doesn't matter what the weather is. <laughs> they still wear the same thing every day, right? It is shorts for Lucas, Gabby has a uniform, and Johnny's always a hoodie. So the weather doesn't actually impact what they do or what they choose to wear. But it shouldn't work that way, right? Checking the weather should actually impact what they choose to wear. It should prompt them to prepare for the day appropriately. So today, I want to talk about paying attention to the weather inside of us, in relation to God, and then how that should actually prompt us to respond. So I'm inviting us actually to a few minutes of compassionate curiosity towards ourselves and towards our walk with God. This willingness to graciously and honestly look at our own hearts and ask for a minute, what's going on? How am I doing? Is it sunny? Is it rainy? Is there a tempestuous storm raging? And then, where do I go from there? Here's why this matters. Sooner or later, every follower of Jesus will experience varying emotions about the closeness of God. If you are following Jesus, listen to this, if you are following Jesus, then you can expect your emotions to wax and to wane towards him. Here's the thing, though. Often, we are caught totally off guard when these things happen. We are surprised when our emotions don't actually match our theology or what we know to be true, right? Or, this is me, we immediately pick up all the shoulds, right, and the shame, and we start collapsing under those. So like, I should pray more. I should feel different. I should be more excited about chapel, right? Or we just kind of ignore our emotions altogether and keep our relationship with God in the realm of intellect and this um, assent to propositions. Or, this might be most true, because we swim in the waters of our current cultural moment, we immediately believe that what we feel is actually what is real, right? So, when God feels distant, we believe that he is far away. Or when God feels silent, we start to think that he is unmoved by our prayers. Because we all have expectations of Jesus, and we all have expectations of what it is like to follow him. And sometimes it's true, we need to adjust our expectations. But sometimes it's also true that we just need to name them so that when we hit up against our own emotions, we have a way to navigate. Just like checking the weather prepares me for a rainy day, right? I won't stay dry just by ignoring the forecast if it's raining. I have to take a look at the weather and I have to accept the fact that it's raining and then I have to dress appropriately. Often though, I think our emotions go unnamed and as we learned last week from Tasha Chapman, expectations are toxic when they remain hidden or are not communicated. So, I want to talk about our emotions and following Jesus. To help us, I want to focus on two specific sort of seasons in a believer's life. 
consolation and desolation. Consolation and desolation. Now, these seasons aren't, unfortunately, they're not like neatly demarcated for us, right, or clean lines. Um, Sometimes we live in between these seasons of consolation and desolation, or sometimes we're a little more on this side or a little more on this side. Sometimes these seasons of consolation and desolation are short, and sometimes they're long. But consolation and desolation are movements of our hearts that require us to pause, and to take a compassionately curious stance towards our own emotion and what's going on inside as we do life with Jesus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define each idea and describe it a little bit. I'm going to give examples of it in Scripture, and then I'm going to consider some ideas of what to do in that particular season in order to move us towards growth and maturity in Christ. So the first is consolation. Consolation refers to the seasons of our life and times in our life when God seems close and near and present and very attentive. It is those seasons when worship makes your heart beat faster, right, and prayer feels focused and life-giving. It's season when, seasons when time in the Word is actually very sweet, and you just can't get enough of it. You want more. It's when time in the Word is encouraging and convicting. It's very alive for you. It's when the kingdom of God is big and exciting, and it's when the body of Christ, even the people involved, is a beautiful thing. It might be even marked by seasons of heightened sensitivity to the Spirit and a renewed zeal for the gospel. Psalm 33, because the Psalms are a great handbook for us in navigating our emotions. We know this, right? But Psalm 33 is a great example of when the psalmist is experiencing a season of consolation. I'm going to read some of it. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre and make melody him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope, who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For, listen, our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Do you hear the language of consolation there? This language of hope and praise, hearts that are glad, shouts of joy, right? These are the songs we sing when everything seems to be going right, when the Lord is showing up, when we can taste and see his goodness in very real ways. And the cool thing about consolation is that it doesn't necessarily correlate to your situation or your circumstance, all right? It doesn't mean that all your circumstances in life are good. In fact, it just means that the Spirit of God is giving you a renewed sense of God's presence, regardless of your situation. So think for a minute. Take a second. Can you think of a time when this was true for you. Maybe you were in a season of consolation for a period of time after you came to Christ, after your conversion. Or maybe you experienced consolation after God answered a significant prayer, right? Or he freed you from a crippling sin. Maybe he met you in your loneliness. But it could also be that God chose to usher you into a season of consolation with ordinary means. The beauty of creation, a song, a great conversation with a friend. Maybe you are experiencing consolation now, this week, today. So then, the question is, what should we do when we find ourselves in a season of consolation? 
In God's story, we actually find so many examples of these seasons of consolation when God draws especially near to his power or or his people and he shows up in a really uniquely powerful way, right? Um, When you're reading through scripture, it's fun. Just keep this paradigm in mind and you'll start to kind of see it everywhere. But I want to look at one particular story that came to mind as I was thinking about this. It's in the book of Joshua, right, when God leads his people of Israel Um, into the promised land. And to do that, they have to cross over the Jordan River. And what God does is he actually does a repeat miracle of the Red Sea. He parts the Jordan River for the people of Israel to cross over into the promised land on dry ground. And then God tells his people, he actually tells Joshua, to collect 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, one for each tribe, and to build a memorial um, out of these 12 stones. And this is what the command is about. Um, In Joshua 4, verse 20, Joshua says to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So this narrative suggests that seasons of consolation, right, when God shows up for us, they exist to encourage us, right, and to strengthen us in our faith and to know who God is to fear him in the biblical sense of the word. But, listen, they are also seasons in which we are supposed to build and construct Ebenezer's stones of remembrance. Seasons of consolations are seasons to strengthen our muscles of faith by marking and commemorating and celebrating the Lord's faithfulness and kindness and nearness and power and love. For the Israelites, it involved literal stones, right? For us, It can be anything that helps us remember. In seasons of consolation, we should be intentional to mark and remember God's faithfulness. And one final note about consolation. Often seasons of consolation precede action on the part of God's people, right? So think about the burning bush, right? Think about Pentecost, Think about Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Think about the three years that the disciples spent doing daily life with Jesus. Consolation is a time of preparation. It's preparing us and then inviting us to be active, to get creative, to step out in courage wherever the Lord leads us. Okay, that's consolation. Let's talk about desolation. Now, before I define desolation, let me just be clear. Desolation is not the same thing as depression, okay? Desolation is not the same thing as depression. That's actually another conversation entirely. Depression is when every single part of life, right, seems um, boring or terrible, right? It's just sort of this general sense of blah, like nothing in life has any kind of interest for you right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about desolation and your journey with Jesus, right? It's different. So desolation refers to those times when spiritual things hold little interest for us, right? When God seems far away and when we have no motivation to pursue time in God's word or in prayer, right? It's so the opposite of consolation. When when the kingdom of God actually is very unmotivated for us, and when the church, it just really gets on our nerves, all right? And the people of God, we could just use a little space, right? It's often marked by feeling hurt or frustrated or angry or alone. Sometimes it correlates to times of suffering and confusion, right? And this feeling like nothing is right, And desolation is often when questions creep up in our minds, right? When we start asking, like, what is going on? Why is God so far away? What is wrong with me? (laughs) What have I done wrong? Why is my heart so hard and so cold? Why am I bored? 
when I read the Bible or when I listen to a sermon? Why am I so distracted in prayer? So hear this. (laughs) Seasons of desolation are normal parts of the pilgrim way. They are normal parts of the pilgrim way. It is normal to have valleys and deserts in your life with God. It is part of the human experience to feel like God is far away sometimes, to feel like he is not always near. Honestly, I don't know why it's that way. I wish it wasn't. (laughs) But it's everywhere in Scripture, right? The Psalms are full of it. In fact, the majority of the Psalms are actually Psalms of complaint or lament. There are more Psalms of complaint and lament than any other Psalm. In other words, those psalms are there to articulate for us these feelings of desolation, right? And sometimes, if we're honest, they articulate those emotions of desolation so, like, rawly and honest, rawly's not a word, but honestly, that we actually wonder, like, is that okay, right? So listen, listen to Psalm 102, just one of the examples. Hear my cry, O Lord, let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. Listen to this language. For my days pass away like smoke and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. I am like a desert owl in the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. How I awake. I am like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse, for I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. Because of your indignation and anger, for you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. Can you relate? Have you ever had times of desolation where you too felt like God has taken you up and thrown you down? Do you remember seasons when you lie awake and you lose your appetite because God seems silent and far away? Those, my friends, are seasons of desolation. And it can be tempting in those seasons of desolation to either despair or to distract ourselves, right? But neither is helpful. So what do we do in seasons of desolation? Well, I will tell you what we don't do. If consolation is often a time that precedes action, right, or a time of preparation, what if desolation is actually a time of stillness? Perhaps it is not the time to make important decisions. Maybe it's more about staying put and waiting on the Lord than it is about stepping out in courage and in faith. Once again, the Psalms are a good guide for us here. Psalms 42.5, it helpfully walks us through this process, actually. It starts like this. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Do you hear that honesty? Right? It's that compassionate curiosity. It's that looking inside for a second and saying, why are you cast down? Why are you so in despair, my soul? It's a willingness to ask ourselves, what's going on? Why does God feel distant? Why am I spiritually desolate? And then listen to the conclusion. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. The psalmist is actually showing us what to do in times of desolation. Be honest with God and with yourself. Tell him exactly how you feel without fear and shame. And then lean on what you know to be true. You know those remembrance stones you built during times of consolation? Take a good and long, hard look at those remembrance stones. Remember, right? Keep praying. Keep surrounding yourself with the body of Christ. Keep seeking nourishment from the Word of God. 
If you can't pray in times of desolation, then read a psalm or ask the body of Christ to pray for you and on your behalf. If you can't read the word, listen to it read over you. But friends, do not panic. Do not panic. Seasons of desolation will come. But like the psalmist, you shall again praise him. One day, one day desolation will give way to consolation. The darkness will give way to light. It will not always be night. And here is the proof of that. Jesus, right? Jesus is evidence that we belong to a God who desires to be near to us. He wants to be in our presence. He always has, and he always will, and he will stop at nothing to make a way to be near to us. He has promised to never leave us or never forsake us, so that even in our seasons of desolation, we know that it feels like he's far away, but he is very near. Jesus confirmed and he guaranteed that for us. When Jesus became man and he took on my sin and he took on your sin, he willingly faced the ultimate desolation on the cross, right? In fact, he screams out to God a psalm of desolation, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But y'all, here's the thing, for him, it was not just a perceived abandonment, but a real one. And he did all of that so that you and I would never experience the absence of God. And I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know if you're in a season of consolation or a season of desolation or somewhere in between. But as you take a moment to check the weather and the forecast of your own heart, find your anchor in this. Because of Jesus, we know that we, God will never, ever forsake us. He will never, ever leave us, not even for a moment. And here's the thing, one day we will experience a never-ending, overwhelming consolation in the presence of God. That is why we can say with the psalmist, hope in God, for I shall again praise him. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts and you know our frame and you are not afraid of our honest feelings towards you and you um, do not withdraw from us and lord we know that because of jesus and we pray father that whether we are in seasons of desolation or consolation that you would give us more of yourself that you would draw us to the truth of what we know and that jesus would be real to us we pray these things in his name. Amen.